All right, so welcome. Uh, so this evening, we're going to go over the fourth Sunday of Lent. And uh, I'll say it again before we close, but just a reminder, no, no meeting next Wednesday. So no meeting next Wednesday, okay? Um, I'll be out for spring break. And uh, you can pray for us because we'll be camping. How's that? So, all right. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, during this Lenten season, nourish us with your word of life and make us one in love and prayer. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So, here are the readings, if you want them. Um, the first reading from is from Second Chronicles, and it's kind of long, and so what we'll kind of do is take it in pieces. Um, but it, it really does connect very well with the gospel and uh, with Paul's letter to the Ephesians that we're going to that we have today. They all they all actually really they fit well together and they they help each other progress, if that if that kind of makes sense. And I think you'll see what I mean as we as we get into it. So a, <laughs> a little bit of background. So. Um, what the reading from Second Chronicles is dealing with, it is, uh, so it's a historical book. It's recounting the history of the Jewish people. And in this section of the readings, the writer, excuse me, is recounting uh, the time leading up, briefly summarizing the, the time leading up to the Babylonian exile. Uh, he very briefly in a sentence touches on the exile itself and then goes into when uh, Cyrus released all of the, the Jewish people from captivity and allowed them to go back to Jerusalem and, and, and rebuild the temple. So it's a it's a lot of history in a very short period of time, but if you when we get into the actual reading, you'll see that the reason he's recounting it the way he is is because it's trying to show us something about who God is and how the people related to God. Okay, so let's jump into this. In those days, so this is the days prior to the, the Babylonian exile. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests, and the people added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. All right, so what are they talking about? So the, the author of Second Chronicles is writing about the period of time after the death of David and Solomon, okay? Um, and they have this string, and I mean a, a long period, of these really bad rulers, okay, kings he's calling them princes but the kings and then even the priests and because it trickles down um to the people they were they they drifted very far away from the faith and they started to do all of the things that Moses told them not to do right uh Moses told them not to intermarry with the pagan tribes. Moses told them not to adopt any of the pagan practices, but to st stay very clear of that. They had the law to keep uh, what, you know, what today, what we call they, to keep kosher. Okay. So what happens is through this time period and this string of bad Kings, they start to do exactly that. Well, it really started kind of with Solomon. 
Um, but Solomon never abandoned his faith. But what Solomon did do was allow some of his wives and concubines who were pagan to start erecting shrines and putting, uh, I guess we could call them figures or idols of their gods in and around the temple area. And that just gets progressively worse. So when the writer talks about adding infidelity to infidelity, he's talking about I mean, that's why we use the word infidelity to describe adultery, right? Because if if God is the bridegroom, if God is the husband and the Jewish people and the temple are are the are the wife, right? Then that's that's how we think of the church today, right? Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. Then to go and start adopting and accepting these pagan gods into your world <clears throat> into your life and ultimately bringing them even into the temple you are committing infidelity you are essentially committing adultery because you are going out with another god okay so when the writer says that and then when he says practicing all the abominations of the nations so it's not enough that they are adopting some of these pagan gods and that they are um, even bringing them to, but now they are starting to practice the pagan abominations. So the pagan abominations would be things like temple prostitution, um, human sacrifice, which there is some historical reference to uh, the Jew, some of the Jews uh, practicing human sacrifice um, at this period, um, but not as Jews, as Jews who were practicing a pagan rite because they thought that the pagan God would be more likely to do what they wanted them to than the Jewish God. So that's what the abominations are. So they're essentially desecrating the temple. And this is, of course, what the writer says, and polluting the Lord's temple. OK, so the reason the writer says all this is because he wants the reader to understand what got them in this situation in the first place, that they turned away from God and they started to go out into the world and grab anything they could grab that they thought was going to take the place of God or do for them what they wanted God to do, but God either wouldn't do or God refrained from doing because it was bad for them or or whatever their thoughts were, or maybe they thought the pagan gods were a little more um, amenable, right? That they would, they could, hey, I can offer this sacrifice and this God's going to make my crops grow. Um, so that's the setup. So then he says, early and often did the Lord the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them. That's the prophets. Okay, so in this period of time, uh, now Isaiah takes place before the Babylonian exile, but now we're, now we are, we are in, so we are in this period before the Babylonian exile, and this is where you start to get this kind of rush of, of, of over the years, all these different prophets. So that's who the writer is talking about. Early and often did the Lord, their God, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them. So God tries to get them to come back. Okay, He tries to get them to see the error of their ways by sending the prophets. For he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. So it's kind of, again, I think probably the best analogy of how we as human beings relate to God is the relationship of a parent to a child. OK, and we are the child. All right. That God knows what is best for us. And God wants to see us succeed, but he also wants to see us grow and mature. And sometimes letting a child grow and mature means letting them fall on their face. Right. Um, if you never let go of the child's hand, the child is never going to learn to walk on its own. OK, if you never let a kid make a mistake, they're never going to learn. 
So this is what this is what the writer means by saying he had compassion on his people. And and the other part of it is that as a parent, even when your kid does something wrong, you still love them. Right? You still you still see them as being redeemable. You don't you don't say the first time your kid does something wrong, you don't just give up on them and say our relationship is completely and irrevocably severed. Okay. And for most of us, I would even say, and, and, you know, I don't know everyone's personal experience and I don't mean it to be that like that, but I, I would imagine for most of us, if we ever did have a big falling out with one of our children, especially like an adult child, and they would say, I don't ever want to see you again. I don't ever want to talk to you again. <clears throat> um, they might say that, but we don't say that. You know what I mean? If that child ever tries to come back, we're going to be there waiting for them. Um, hopefully. Um, that's the prodigal son. Okay. And then, then he says, but they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings and scoffed at his prophets. So that is the history of what happened when the prophets came. Uh, especially the people that had power to actually do anything. That's how they treated the prophets. The prophets were not treated well. In fact, if anything, you know, there's a reason that prophets like Jonah and Jeremiah, uh, when God calls them to be prophets, their response is, are you talking, not me, or, oh, 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 okay, okay. And then Jonah gets on a boat and tries to leave, right? Um, nobody, nobody wanted to be a prophet back then because it was a sure way to be hated by everyone. Why? It's the same reason today we don't like prophets because what is a prophet? A prophet is a, someone who comes to us speaking the truth, but the reason they've come is because the truth needs to be spoken because we have drifted that far away from it. Okay. So then he says, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. So they got to the point where there was really nothing God, God had tried everything to bring them back and they weren't having it. Okay. So God allows the Babylonians to conquer. And this is what Isaiah warns them about. That if they do not turn back to God, right now God is holding these armies back. But if they don't turn back to God, God will God will remove his hands and let these armies come in. And that's what I th this is what I'm talking about when I say that when I said that, you know, sometimes like with a kid, you know, uh you have to let them make their mistakes and sometimes you have to let them fall on their face. Um, because otherwise they'll never learn. So the falling on their face is the Babylonian conquest. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. And this is what the Babylonians did. They came in. They basically destroyed the city. Uh, they killed a lot of people. But most importantly and most egregiously, they destroyed the temple. So the Jews no longer have a place to offer sacrifice. And this would have been the temple that Solomon built, okay, after the reign of David. Those who escaped the sword, so those who weren't just killed, were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. So this is now you're getting into, if you're like, if you're thinking about where does this all fit in biblically, um, now you're getting into the book of Daniel. Okay. Uh, that, so Daniel is writing about the, the experience of the Jews in Babylonian captivity. So they are hauled off into essentially captivity, slavery again. Now, one of the things I want to say real quick, and and uh, it's worth remembering, I think, you know, I, we say it a lot, but it's worth remembering that in 
in Judaism, especially in the Old Testament, the thought is when when they are sent into exile, it's not just a physical displacement, but it's a spiritual displacement as well. Okay, so the idea of exile is God is allowing them to be placed physically where they are spiritually. So everything leading up to the Babylonian exile, the people were saying, we want to be like all these other pagan kingdoms, right? We want that life. We want to live and operate like these pagan kings and these pagan kingdoms. And we want to be wealthy and we want to be powerful, militarily powerful, politically powerful. And so what God is saying is, if that is what you want, then you can have it. The problem is, you don't really know what you're saying when you say that's what you want. So when they are sent to Babylon in captivity, Babylon is the world example of the pagan kingdom. Babylon is what the Jewish people at this time are saying, this is what we want. And God is saying, then you've got it. Okay. And of course, then they realize buyer's remorse, right? Um, that actually living in a large metropolitan pagan city is not as much fun as you thought it was going to be okay um so so that's what happened and he says but he does say until the kingdom of the persians came to power so that is also part of the pagan world is the babylonian empire because it was so large <laughs> It ended up bringing in people, especially into some of the higher places in government from different parts of the empire, and the Persians ended up with a lot of highly placed people, and so eventually the Persians throw a coup, and they take the Babylonian empire, and it now becomes the Persian empire, okay? Um, of course... Though the writer then says, all this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was one of the prophets pre-exile. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths. During all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. So he's saying the temple's been destroyed. The Jews can't offer sacrifice. Um, but yet they have to figure out how to retrieve the lost idea of the Sabbath. One of the things I will, uh, just kind of a historical tidbit for you, this in during the time of the Babylonian exile is where you start to see the beginning of what will later become like the Pharisees. Okay. Because the Jews don't have the temple. So the Sadducees, which they're not the Sadducees at this time, but the Levites, the, the priestly clan, they don't really have anything to do. They don't have any power. They don't have any authority because there's no temple. So the, the, a, a group arises that puts a, a heavy focus on the law and the reading of the scriptures. Okay. And this is where you start to see the the um the development of the idea of like the rabbi right so not a priest but a teacher of the law okay uh and the idea of the scribes all this starts to come and they're not calling them any of these things at this point but you start to see the beginnings of it and they become very very important because they don't have the temple but then after this time when the Persians take over, now, I guess, like, you know, your timeout is over, your punishment is over, you're going to be allowed to return. So then uh, he says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom both by word of mouth and in writing. 
Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven has given to me. He has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs in, to any part of his people, let him go up and may his God be with him. So this is the moment where Cyrus uh, has a vision, a dream, and, you know, we can argue about what he actually experienced. It doesn't really matter because the fact of the matter is that whatever he experienced, he believed it was a message from the Hebrew God. And he took it so seriously that he freed all of the Jewish, the Jews that were in captivity throughout the Babylonian Empire. And not only does he free them to go back to Jerusalem, but he even pays for, he funds the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. Okay. And I, I would say one of the big lessons in all this is. We never know who God is working through, okay? And just because someone is not part of your group, and so like in this sense, we would say just because someone is not necessarily a Christian, and certainly just because someone is not necessarily a Catholic, does not mean that God cannot work through this person if they let him. So Cyrus was certainly not a Jew, um, but yet his heart was in some way open to God so that when God came to him, he was prepared for that, and he he did it. I mean, I mean, I guess that's the tell is that he he actually did it. Um, and so I think we it's, it was a reminder of us that we have to be very careful not to discount the good that someone is trying to do just because they're not part of a certain group. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, anybody got any questions? That was a, that's the longest reading. But it does really set up the other two. So I, we needed to kind of go into all that detail. Um, and you got, you got any questions or comments about that reading? Quick question. Who wrote this Corona kit? Do we know. know? There is no... Or... No. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. We, well, I didn't know about... I never heard about this. This is the first time, really, that I hear yeah. about Corona kit. Um, so there, there's there's first chronicles and second chronicles, and they will give you. Uh, let me let me let me see real quick if I can. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab this Bible. I'll see real quick if it gives. I don't I don't I don't think. I don't think that it does so. Uh, yeah, it just says the, the person, the person is just called the chronicler and is never really given a name. Now, some, some people think that it might have been Ezra, who was one of the, who wrote the book of the, we have the book of, and, and of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, some people think it might be Ezra. Some people think it might be a guy named Morris. But it doesn't matter. But but regardless, yeah, there's no no one really knows who who wrote it. Okay. Yeah, that they, they just refer to them as the chronicler. So and there's a first and second chronicles. Um, if you want to go read them on your own, because we we don't get too much out of them in the, you know, in the daily readings. You're not going to see them so often that it's easy to make a narrative. Um, but yeah, that's first and second chronicles. Okay. Any, anybody else? Sorry. That's a pretty unsatisfying answer. <laughs> so, um, okay. All right. Well, so the setup then is keeping in mind one, the people turn away from God. God sends people with his message, with his word, with his help. And remember, a lot of the prophets did some miraculous things. They gave signs and all this other stuff um, to try to bring the people back. The people's reaction to the prophets was overwhelmingly negative, so much so that several of the prophets, they even, they even killed. Okay. 
because of that, they are now put into exile and the temple is destroyed. Okay. And it is only much later that they are allowed to come back, but things are never going to be the same. Okay. Um, and it is also the idea that a person does not have to be part of your group to do something good. Um, that a, a person can be open to God no matter who they are, where they are, what their situation is. All right. So with that, now we jump into the gospel. And this is uh, John's gospel, chapter three. This is the um, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Um, and somebody, if you can remember, I, this morning I tried to remember and I meant to look it up and I didn't. Um, so just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the son of man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Okay. What is the name of that thing that is, it's on the side of the ambulances. It's the, it's the, the, you see like the little pole and the cross with the serpents wrapped around it. That, that's what, that's what this is. Um, anybody know the name of what, it, what is that thing called? If you, 10 bucks, if you, if you can throw it out there. So I'll give it to you out of the money we just collected for the capital campaign. So um, well, somebody can find it, just put it in the comments or something or, or, or say it. I, I, I couldn't remember. I can't, still can't remember what it's called, but that's also it, just, if you want to know, that's why it came to be put on like ambulances and hospitals because it, it, it becomes the symbol of healing, right? That if you see this, if you see this, this, um, staff with the serpent wrapped around it, you know that healing is coming. That that's how it ended up being put on uh, mm -hmm. ambulances and hospitals and things like that. So, just kind of an interesting thing. So you can wow your friends next time you're in the car, and you see you see if you see one. Um, okay, but now why is Jesus telling Nicodemus this? Because Jesus is saying that what Moses did for you in a very physical way, because remember, this was the time when uh, they're on the Sinai Peninsula and they're going through a particular area where there are a lot of venomous snakes. And a lot of the people are getting bit by these snakes and they're dying. And God tells Moses to make this thing with the serpent, the bronze serpent, and anyone raise it up, and anyone who gazes upon the serpent on the bronze cross will be healed, okay? So Moses, by gazing on that that rendition, in that they are able to be physically healed of a snake bite, what Jesus is saying is like that the Son of Man himself will also be lifted up and anyone who gazes upon him will not just be healed, but will have eternal life. Okay. So whatever Moses does for the people in a very physical, very visceral sense, Jesus does times infinity. Moses offered them temporary physical healing from a very specific affliction. Jesus offers through the same mode, eternal life. OK, um, and where it was the serpent that bit them. So it's the serpent represented on the thank you. Oh, man, James, I appreciate you now that you put that now. Now, I'm, I don't even know how to begin to pronounce that Greek word. So <laughs> um, you just have to read the name then. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you can yeah. read it. How's that? So, um, yeah. And 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 uh, I also think it's interesting that you see that that is also connected with the Greek with the Greek god of medicine. So it's kind of interesting how the two worlds collide there. Um, okay, so then Jesus says though, for God so or John says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. 
probably one of the most famous passages in all of scripture. That's why whenever you see like on the football game, somebody holding up a sign, this is John 3, 16. That's it. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. That is the ultimate message of Christianity. That's what it's all about. Okay. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So this is the same thing. God did not send the prophets to condemn the Jews. He sent the prophets to save them from themselves. God did not send Christ to condemn us. Christ came to save us from ourselves. Okay. Then he says, whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned. Jump back to Chronicles. Whoever heeded the prophets would be saved. They would change their life and go a different way. But whoever did not listen to the prophets has already condemned themselves. Okay. By their refusal to listen, they have sealed their fate. The Babylonians are coming and they are going to, if they're not killed, they're going to be hauled off into captivity. Because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the verdict. That the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. And, you know, I, I think to me, the hardest thing about these passages is you could easily take everything that's going on in these scripture passages. You could easily take what John is saying here about the light comes into the world, but the people preferred the darkness to light because their works were evil. All this could just as easily as it was spoken to the people in the first century could be applied to our culture today. That, you know, here comes the son of man and we condemn ourselves because we choose not to acknowledge him. Um, the light comes into the world and we know it's the light because we've seen, we have the, the, the witnesses of the saints, right? We, we've seen what mother Teresa did. We've seen what John Paul II did. We, we see what these people do and how they live their lives. And we all say, wow, that's wonderful. What, what a beautiful witness, but yet we prefer the darkness. We say, well, that's fine for you, but, and I'm not saying we, like I'm using the royal we, not hopefully us right here. Hopefully we're at least trying, uh, but, but the, the world, our culture seems to be very content with being in the darkness. Why? Because, and, and what Jesus is saying is, he says, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. That's the, why, why does our culture love the darkness? Why do we want to keep everyone in the dark? Because once the light is shown on what we're doing as a culture, then we can see how how what we are doing and what we value is the opposite of what God has told us to value. Um, and, and I'll let you be the judge of that. So then he says, but whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be seen, may be clearly seen as done in God. If we are living a life ordered towards God and we are doing the works of God as best we can, we don't fear those works being exposed because they're good, right? Why, why would you, why would you, you're not going to be mad that someone found out that you donated a bunch of food to Christian action. No one, you're, you're not going, no one's going to be mad that your neighbor found out that, you know, you um, spend your time, you know, helping the poor or, or, you know, you spend your time helping, you know, the kids or whatever it is you're doing, you know, whatever good works you're doing, no one's going to be 
upset when those works come to light. Um, but if you're doing evil things, then of course, no one wants their neighbor finding out that, you know, you're a liar and a cheat. No one wants their neighbor finding out that, you know, they're doing all these things they're not supposed to be doing or that are unsavory, even if our society accepts them. So they hide it. They don't want it to be known because they are rightly embarrassed by it and shamed by it. So they want to keep it in the dark. Okay. Anybody got any questions or comments about the gospel? <clears throat> All right. Well, let's move on uh, to Ephesians. And if something comes to your mind, just, uh, you know, let me know. <clears throat> so in Ephesians, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us. I'm going to stop there. Jumping back to Chronicles, Paul is saying this, and it and you see how it fits with Chronicles, that even though we are sinners, God still has this great love and mercy for us. And even we see it even more so because of Christ. Because Paul continues, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought brought us God, God, he's saying God brought us to life with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, raised up with him. So he's saying that it is not through anything that we have done, but it is through God's mercy that even in our mm -hmm. sinfulness, even though we are rightly and God could in justice leave us dead in our transgressions, not dead physically, eventually dead physically, but also dead spiritually, but instead in his mercy and goodness, like him getting Cyrus to let the people go and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, in God's love and mercy, he brings us to new life in Christ, and it is by the grace of God because of Christ that we are saved, not because of our own merits. Um, and he says, seated and has seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So salvation. That in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, for the rest of human history, and in the new heaven and the new earth, eventually, that God's grace is going to be shown in this these in an immeasurable ways, which I would I would say that it happens every day, right? We we see it every day, um, from the time of the apostles to now, we have seen God's immeasurable grace given out to the world, uh, and of course, we have also seen when we or we as humans fall away from that how quickly things go bad uh and 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 how quickly things just take a nosedive for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from you it is the gift of god it is not from works so no one may boast so what what is paul saying there he is saying that God's grace is what saves us and the grace that we have that we receive from God even the grace of faith is a gift from God now like someone like say um the theologian von Balthasar Thomas Aquinas um I'm just throwing some some I'm, I'm think trying to think of people who have recently written about this um even Bishop Barron you know would would argue that it sounds like maybe Paul is saying that God gives us faith as a gift, right? That God gives us our, we don't come to faith. God gives faith to some and maybe not to others, but they will all say, no, 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 no. The offer of faith is something that God is always and everywhere offering us. So the gift of faith is always there. We have to accept it. That's where we come in. The grace of faith, God is always offering us. We just have to say 
Yes. Um, now, the further we get away from God and the further the depth of our sinfulness, it is arguable that the more difficult it is going to be for us to accept that. But it's always there. Um, and then why Paul says it is not, this is why Paul says it is a gift from God, of God. It is not from works so that no one may boast. And what it, what Paul is saying there is, like if you if you imagine talking to the Jewish population of Ephesus, who are very insistent on the living out the law of Moses to the letter and thinking that salvation is found in living out the law in this very strict sense and in this very minutia bound sense that what Paul is trying to remind them is, no, your faith, your salvation is a gift of God. There is nothing that you can do to earn it, because if you can earn it, then you can demand it, right? I did X number of good works, and you said I had to do X number of good works to get into heaven, and I did it, so now you have to let me in, okay, that I did it, and I can boast about it. I did this. I did that. Look how good I am. Look how wonderful I am. I did all of these things. God now has to honor me because of all the things that I did. And Paul is saying, no, that that is not how salvation works. Now, if you jump to the letter of James, where James says faith without works is dead, this is not contradictory to what Paul is saying. It is still our faith that saves us. But what James is kind of adding on here is that works do not save you. But if you have true faith in God, you're going to do good works. Okay. Good doing the good works is a side effect of the faith that you have. It's <clears throat> not that the it's not the faith, it's not the works that save you. So then he says, for we are his handiwork of God, created created in Christ Jesus. The time I walked down the aisle, get off the bus, he had already locked the door and walked in the building. I'm going to, um, for, so he says, for we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. So that God created us with all this goodness that we can do. And God has even prepared the opportunities for us to do this good in advance. That's what Paul is getting at. That, that God has set all this up so that you can accept the faith and now you can go out and do these good works because your faith, not, not that your faith... Re, um, hinges on it but that your faith is going to call you to do good Is that hopefully that makes sense okay um all right any questions about paul any questions about any questions about anything all right you guys are good then okay um going once all right so uh, just one more quick reminder, no meeting next week. Enjoy the week off. Weather's supposed to be really nice next week, so hopefully it stays that way. Um, and when we come when we come back, we're in the fifth Sunday of Lent, Saint, which is also St. Patrick's Day, by the way. Um, and then we only have a week left, and it's Holy Week. So uh, Lent's going by pretty fast, so okay. All right. Well, with that, I'll let you guys go and hope the readings give you something to think about for the rest of the week. What I would really kind of focus on is, you know, when God sends people into my life that have a message, right? When God gives me his word in the scriptures, in the mass, when I hear them, do I scoff at them? Do I ignore them? Or do I take them to heart, um, are the things that I do, would I be okay if the things that I did were exposed to the light or am I wanting them to stay hidden in the darkness? And 
what it, how, how can I change that if, if that is the case, okay? All right, good deal. And I'll see you guys in two weeks. And we'll go ahead and close. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All right, guys, take care, and I will see you all in two weeks.